Hello, and welcome to the third talk in our summer research seminar series, Out to Sea. My name is Rebecca Tropp. I'm the research and events convener here at the Paul Mellon Center. And it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Lewis P. Nelson, who, we, who will be giving an approximately 30-minute talk, followed by a response from Shaheen Ali Khan. After a conversation between Lewis and Shaheen, we will open the floor to questions from the audience. Those of you in the room will be able to ask your question directly to them. We ask that you speak into the mic so that our online audience can hear. And those of you online can type your question into the Q&A box. And then I will raise my hand and whoever's circulating the microphone will give it to me and I can ask your question online. So just as a brief introduction to today's speakers, Lewis P. Nelson is professor of architectural history at the University of Virginia, or UVA. He specializes in the built environments of the early modern Atlantic world with published work on the American South, the Caribbean, and West Africa, and is a leading advocate for the reconstruction of place-based public history. Um, and I'd like to highlight simply one of Lewis's many publications, his 2016 monograph, Architecture and Empire in Jamaica, which was published by Yale University Press, and it's won various major awards, and it's absolutely fantastic, and I really think it's a must-read text. For those of you who are in London, you can peruse a copy of it in the Paul Mellon Center's library, along with many other books, pamphlets, exhibition catalogs, and theses on British art um, as broadly conceived. And if you have not already registered as a reader um, for our library, it's a very simple process, and it gives you access to an incredible collection that is constantly growing. So I really recommend, if you're in London, that you should come visit us. From a more personal perspective, um, I first met Lewis at a conference in 2017. Then I re-met him at UVA the following year when I was taking part in a summer program looking at racialized topographies in central Virginia, a topic to which Lewis has dedicated significant time. And then fast forward to COVID, and I was able to secure him as one of the speakers for an online interdisciplinary conference that I organized through CRASH, which is Cambridge, Cambridge's Center for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities. I'm therefore very excited to have him here in the room, um, especially knowing how busy his schedule is. It is also through Lewis that I have become aware of Shaheen Ali Khan's work. Um, Shaheen is a PhD student in the Interdisciplinary Constructed Environment Doctoral Program at UVA School of Architecture. Her research continues from her master's thesis on the construction of 18th century slaving vessels, which she is currently in talks to publish as Building a Floating Prison, Slave Ships Throughout the Long 18th Century. Her PhD research focuses on the reshaping and creation of waterfront spaces to facilitate the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing and reading more about her research on these liminal and largely overlooked spaces as her work continues to develop. So with that out of the way, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Lewis P. Nelson, who will be speaking to us about global houses of the Afik. Thank you, Rebecca. It's a delight to be here. It's a delight always to work with you and so many other colleagues and friends in the room. Uh, I'm feeling uh, uh, just really touched, actually, to be here and to see so many fr uh, friendly face faces. Um, <clears throat> and it's also a delight uh, to have the opportunity to present some of this work. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the conversation afterwards as we think about uh, the edges of uh, the way we define art and the ways that systems shape the way we think about art, art production, and art consumption. In May of 1843, the Liverpool Times announced the opening of a spectacular exhibition in the yard near the post office, a prefabricated iron palace intended for Old Calabar, West Africa. Built by a local iron merchant, the palace was two stories over a raised basement, the whole encased by a two-story veranda. Its exterior was to be painted a light stone color to resist the solar heat, according to a local reporter. The ground floor chambers boasted 10-foot ceilings, and the 12-foot tall upper story was dominated by a single, extremely and airy, handsome room, richly ornamented with splendid pictures and papier-mâché. Open to visitors through the summer, as its ornamentation was being completed, the spectacular Iron Palace was a great curiosity. Now, surely part of that curiosity of British visitors was that this building had been ordered from Liverpool by an Efik king in West Africa. 
The international purchase of such an enormous luxury good as a house challenged British preconceptions of both African agency and African taste. Now, just three years later, in 1846, missionary Hope Masterson Waddell visited the very same building by now re-erected in Duketown in Old Calabar, as you can see on the map on the right, along the banks of the Calabar River, now in southeast Nigeria. One of the most intensive slaving communities in the Bight of Biafra, Old Calabar was a series of Efik trading towns in the estuaries of the Cross River Delta. Visiting decades after the British abolished their legal slave trade, Waddell noted the continuing wealth of Calabar elites who had pivoted from trading in enslaved people to trading in palm oil. Having paid his respects to various local leaders of the region, Waddell made his way to Duke Town, which was filled with houses he described as low and mud plastered, palm thatched, without windows, but each with a capacious door leading to a small courtyard. He did note from the ship's deck that there were several two-story wooden frame houses, and then the king's iron house in the center of town. Arriving at the Obong's palace, Obong is a term for king, covered and roofed with galvanized plates and handsomely furnished, he was disappointed at the lack of prospect because the palace was shut in by means of native houses, some of them even built up against it. Eventually admitted to the handsomely uh, furnished stateroom, he met Obong, hold on just a second, did we? Yep, there we are. Uh, so the stateroom is the, uh, is the upper floor, as you can see on the floor plan on the right. He met Obong Ayamba in black hat and feathers with waist cloth, according to country fashion, and loads of beads and brass rings. Waddell reported Obong Ayamba, an elderly man, paraded before large mirrors, turning and admiring himself in every attitude. The Obong's manner was echoed by his two pet peacocks, which wandered freely through the house. After admiring himself for some time, Ayemba eventually sat, sat in an armchair of solid brass under a handsome canopy meant for a throne. Four sofas were wheeled around in front of the company and a small table placed in the center for the gift Bible brought by the missionary. A few days later, Waddell was summoned by Obong Ayamba to a dinner in that very same stateroom. Ayamba was now dressed in his best style, broad silk waistcoat, hat and feathers, profusion of beads, but neither shirt nor shoe. In the dining room was a long table laid out and properly furnished. Ayamba took the head, his white guests all sat on his right, the black on his left. Although seated at a long dining table in the European manner, the meal was a regional West African tradition, including pepper stew with yam, the, um, uh, a fish stew with palm oil, and yam and goat stew, each served in a hollowed out calabash. Pounded yams or fufu was served in a locally fired earthen pot. Just a few days after his dinner in the famous Iron Palace, Waddell writes, he began to prepare erecting the wood frame house he had, we had brought with us from Liverpool. Obong Ayamba's Iron Palace was a global house filled with global goods, one born of African incentives. And by showing these, I'm just, this is an imaginary representation or aggregation of things. I mean no representation of a specific object. Let <laughs> me be very clear about that. Obong Ayamba's Iron Palace is a global house filled with global goods, one born of African incentives and embedded in a local cultural context that speaks to the deep material and economic connections between Ifik elites in Calabar, who controlled the lower Calabar and Cross Rivers, and merchants of British port in Liverpool. Ayamba assembled his material world to his own liking, signaling status to both locals and international visitors. But more importantly, experienced by Ayamba and his immediate circle as an integrated material whole. While Waddell and early visitors made a point of differentiating between African and European material and cultural modes, this paper seeks to understand Abong Ayamba's palace and its predecessors as sites of intentional curation by patrons 
who were active consumers of and contributors to the making of the Atlantic world. This house and many others that preceded it was literally a transatlantic product, one whose story opens a window into the underexamined context of elite Africans as strategic consumers of English and European goods and builders of global houses. Now, critical to understanding the story of this extraordinary Iron Palace is the fact that it was, most, it was only the most spectacular example of a long practice of Africans importing English and European-made goods for the fashioning by Africans of West African port cities. By at least the 1790s, leading EFIG traders were importing whole house frames from Liverpool. This connection was so well established that Ebo Young's house in Duke Town in the late, uh, late 18th century was even called Liverpool Hall. Writing back to London during a three-month stay in Calabar, Henry Nichols describes a typical trading, a trader's house, a typical house in 1805. The principal traders' houses are built of wood, brought out by different captains of Liverpool, oblong, and thatched with bamboo leaves, which last very well for two years. The house I reside in was brought out by Mr. Patrick Fairweather, built in the year of 1785, and still remains very good. A description of mine will suffice for the rest, for they are all built on the same principle. The house is about 20 yards long, 30 feet high, and a ground floor, a first floor, and a kind of cock loft. The first floor contains two rooms, one I occupy and the other my attendants, and two small rooms in each wing for bedrooms. My room is about 40 feet long, 20 feet high, and sorry, 20 feet wide, and 15 feet high, and has been very handsomely furnished. A covered gallery surrounds the house. Nichols note, then noted that the interior of his guest house that he occupied put me in mind of a drawing room in England. I have two large pier glasses, seven feet by four, elegantly gilt and ornamented, 25 ditto, two and a half to four feet tall, three large sofas, 12 chairs, two handsome escritoire desks, six tables, one handsome marble sideboard, an immense quality of quantity of glasses, china, and earthenware, six paintings, 20 large engravings, five clocks, and two, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself, five clocks and two musical clocks ditto. A pretty jumble furniture it is. Now, these houses were certainly intended by their builders to signal their status and wealth to their local community and to signal their fluency with the structures of the transatlantic trade to their international interlocutors. These houses were commonly the sites of dinners hosted by African traders for ship's captains and other British agents. But these material practices are rightly understood as part of an integrated materiality of the, of the Atlantic world. The interpretive potential of this material integration is to see the larger project of elite self-fashioning, the participation in the circumatlantic project by elite, uh, elite effique to gain strategic advantage in the expo exploding marketplace of commodification and consumption. Put simply, powerful Africans were strategic and intentional participants in the rapidly expanding marketplace of the long 18th century. Now, the Builder magazine, in its description of the Iron Palace, makes this point clear. Obanga Yumba had been in conversation with Liverpool correspondents about ordering a house that would be grander than any of the others had been previously ordered by regional African elites. But when the cost of a fully iron house was returned to a Yumba, he pivoted and chose a more economical wood frame with an iron cladding so that the external appearance would remain largely unchanged. Once the detailed negotiations were finished, His Majesty gave order for the house. Although manufactured in Liverpool, this iron palace was ordered by an African chief who intended to signal his preeminence and worldliness to both local and international audiences. That a young, a, a Bunga Yumba had business correspondence in Liverpool should come as no surprise. As David Imboa and other historians have documented, the Calabar region of West Africa had traded with British and European ships for generations. For various reasons, the Ifik had, had risen to regional prominence and economic advantage a century before their economic interactions with Europeans began to expand. 
Exploiting the, the natural advantages of the delta, which you can see here, the EFIG shifted towards a trade economy, depending far less on farming, fishing, and hunting. And in so doing, they embraced currency and fixed prices, practices that easily transferred to their interactions with British ship captains who began free to, frequenting the Calabar by the late 17th century. And so these are changes that are happening prior to their robust engagement with Europeans, traders in the 17th century. The EFIC were involved in transatlantic slave trade as early as the 1660s, and the growing wealth generated by that trade secured their regional dominance. Over the 18th century, individual EFIC traders forged relationships with preferred merchants in Liverpool, born primarily of the extraordinary financial inter interdependence between the two places after the 1750s. Liverpool was Britain's leading port for the exportation of African captives into the Atlantic slave trade by the 1750s. Three decades later, the port commanded 90% of the British trade. And Calabar merchants reserved the majority of their trade, 85%, for British chips coming from Liverpool. But the African traders shaped this relationship to their advantage in a very distinctive way. In contrast to their counterparts elsewhere along the African coast, Chiefs in the Bight of Biafra, which included the regions of Calabar, never granted Europeans the right to build trading posts, which over time became trading forts and castles on their soil, as you see here. African traders in Biafra, so these are all examples of uh, the substantial uh, trading forts that became these uh, castles for the containment and trade of enslaved Africans uh, that are now surviving along the west coast of Ghana, or the coast of Ghana. Uh, the builders, uh, the uh, elite Ifik, uh, more broadly in this particular region, never allowed Europeans to build claim land in the ways that their counterparts along what becomes modern Ghana did. So African traders in Biafra understood their interactions with trading partners along the Gold Coast, now Ghana, that the construction of a European fort could certainly serve as a catalyst for local economic development. But they also knew that allowing such a fort ceded too much leverage, too much wealth to Europeans. Upon meeting Egbo, uh, Egbo Young Eyamba, a different Ifik king, in 1805, Henry Nichols reported back to his readers in London that the chief was unhappy at my arrival. He, he was, in fact, very badly received. Eyamba wished to know if Nichols intended to bring either of the two great economic threats, the rhetoric of the English abolitionist Wilberforce, or the intent to build a fort. The result of this policy of forbidding European forts was the growth of an entirely African-controlled trading towns along the banks of these various rivers, centers that were connected to vast trading networks into the African interior. Ifik trading towns were the seats of African merchants who engaged in regular correspondence with merchants in England. London in the 17th century, Bristol in the early 18th century, and Liverpool at the height of the trade in the later 18th century. These ships waited sometimes for only a few weeks, but often up to a year in the safe haven of the Niger or Cross River deltas. And they collected almost a third of all their captives taken from Africa in British slaver ships, a higher percentage than any other region across West Africa. Those business relationships pivoted after 1807 to traffic primarily in palm oil rather than people, but many of the business relationships remained intact. West African traders were savvy businessmen. They actively limited European access to the interior, for example, preserving for themselves the role of the middleman between the demand for and the supply of captive peoples. In this deeply researched and compelling examination of the African port of Anamabo, now in modern Ghana, historian Randy Sparks devotes an entire chapter to the story of John Coranti, the leading African trader of that town in the early 18th century. Sparks reveals Coranti's strategy for forging social and economic relationships and alliances by sending one son to Paris and the other to London to be educated. In so doing, these young men were gathering strategic information and equipping their father to play European powers uh, off of one another for personal gain by the European trader, oh, sorry, by the African trader. Kuranti and many other African agents were hardly economic pawns. Sparks argues that the successful, capable, and wily merchants of Anamabo were as essential and integral to the Atlantic commerce as those of London, 
Liverpool, Cadiz, not Charleston, New York, or Kingston. We can and should assume the same of the merchants of Calabar. Obanga Yamba, for example, was familiar enough with Liverpool merchants to find an iron merchant willing to prefabricate a house. But in light of the decline of the British slave trade, of the legal slave trade, he was also interested in the transition to a local plantation economy based on cotton, coffee, and sugarcane. He wished to ensure his control over such a prospect. In 1846, within a decade of the termination of slavery in the British Caribbean, um, as opposed to the 1807 termination of the trade, this is the termination of slavery in the Caribbean itself in the 1830s, he reported to Waddell, I hear your countrymen done spoil West Indies. I think he wants to come spoil we country all the same. Now, these elite traders were also quite familiar with London and Liverpool, as many of them, like John Caranti and Alamabu, sent their sons to be educated there. It has always been the practice of merchants and commanders of ships trading to Africa, a group of Liverpool traders would report, uh, to encourage the natives to send their children to England, as it not only consolidates their friendships and softens their manners, but adds greatly to the security of the trade, which answers the purposes of both interest and humanity. The education in England of favored sons of African kings was an advantage not only for the traders, but also for their Liverpool merchants, who wished to secure the trust and favor of those soon to be very powerful African men. The Ifik had been trading with English slaver ships since the first sustained contact in Old Calabar in the 1660s. Most historians agree that Ifik traders in Old Calabar were in direct contact with Liverpool business correspondents and partners by the 1760s, by which point there is rarely a period that, they are not, that there are not at Liverpool Calabar Negroes sent here expressly to learn English in our university. In 1805, Henry Nichols, as he prepared for his never taken expedition into the African interior, was called upon by Otto Ephraim, an Ifik man, who had received his education in Liverpool. By the end of the 18th century, Old Calabar's elite had built a clear and intentional relationship with the merchants of this major English port city. Now, Duke Town was the leading town of Old Calabar, a community of about 2,000 residents at the beginning of the 19th century. The Duke family founded their own trading center in 1840, sorry, 1748, first called New Town, but soon thereafter known as Duke Town, which rose in prominence among the various trading towns in the later decades of the 18th century. This was especially the case after the massacre of 1767, in which leading traders from this Duke town successfully conspired with British traders to massacre 300 leading men from Old Town, one of Duke town's leading competitors. As a result, Duke town and neighboring Henshaw town, which was an adjacency, were the major centers of the slave trade in, throughout the later 18th century Calabar. Though he believed that the traders held all of the power and were in his eyes of far greater importance, Nichols, who is our um, uh, British correspondent, Nichols included a visit to the king during his engagements in Old Calabar in 1805. Slaving exhibitions sent by Ifik traders into the African interior were not usually launched until a ship had anchored in the river and an agreement had been reached between the captain and the local merchant. Enslaved Africans arrived in Calabar in great canoes which usually belonged to a trader's canoe house, the major organizational framework for trading among the elite, uh, the Ifi, Usually headed by, the trader of a, of, by a trader of great charisma and talent in the trade, these canoe houses functioned as trading companies connecting numerous households which generally shared kinship ties in different locations up and down these river systems. So after a long journey, uh, newly captive uh, Africans were, dis dis were distributed among the houses of a town where they were then washed and fed in preparation for sale to a ship captain. English trading records provide ample evidence for the purchase by Ifi traders of iron manilas, often inscribed with the merchant's name, suggesting that the captives were in fact shackled whilst awaiting purchase. In 1773, for example, Ifi trader Robin John, come on in, it's all good, in 1773, for example, Ifik trader uh, Robin John ordered from Liverpool agent Ambrose Lace large leg manilas with locks and large iron manilas for his room of irons, suggesting that John had a small prison in his courthouse compound. 
As a result, Duke Town and other smaller trading towns in the region were filled with houses that functioned as small-scale centers of containment and processing for those people intended for sale to British captains. Now, if 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 elites were trading with British captains for common and luxury goods throughout the 18th century, they began ordering luxury goods and specialty items, including whole houses, by the closing decades of the century. One especially lengthy 1773 order sent by EFIC trader Robin John and received by Liverpool agent Ambrose Lace included materials to fit out his slaving canoes, trade goods, and items for personal use. To keep his operations running, he ordered new canvas to make sails for his canoes, large leg manilas with locks and small iron manilas. Trade goods to purchase captive Africans at inland markets included hats, hand mirrors, pewter and brass drinking containers and basins, flintlock muskets, butter, sugar, drinking horns, caps, canes, and nails. But beyond these items, a substantial portion of the items on John's list were for his personal consumption. He also requested furniture for his house, including 100 yards of shints, a large gilt mirror, one table, six chairs, two armchairs, two small writing desks, and a stool. For dining, he ordered 12 plates, four dishes, 12 knives, 12 forks, two large tablespoons, etc. John was also aware of the various personal items that signaled status and refinement to his British partners. He ordered a long gold-mounted walking cane and two coats with lace, gold lace, one red, one blue, to fit a large man, and one case of shaving razors. This commitment to personal consumption extended even to monogramming. He said, please, ha- please have my name put on everything that you send to me. But maybe most importantly, John understood that this substantial order brought him leverage for future trading. He wrote to Lace that if all of these items were to John's satisfaction, then upon its arrival in the region, Lace's ship would stand no long in the river meaning that John would ensure a speedy supply of enslaved cargo on on Lace's ship and a shorter cost-saving wait along the West African coast. Given the substantial morbidity among the enslaved, the longer the wait, the greater the loss of life and therefore the greater loss of financial investment. Both John and Lace understood that goods especially luxury goods, were critical vehicles in the construction of African and English wealth, and by extension, elite identity in the machinery of the Atlantic market. This access to the Atlantic market meant that wealthy African traders were deeply enmeshed in the transatlantic practice of elite self-fashioning. John Caranti's son returned to Anamabu from London in a full-dress scarlet suit with gold lace, a pointed hat, handsome white feather, diamond, solitaire buttons, etc. He even had his portrait painted in London, seen here. Familiar with British comportment and fashion, elite elite ethnic traders typically dressed in English clothing when entertained on a slaver ship by its captain. And these traders reciprocated by inviting the captains to dine in their houses as well. And these traders, sorry, uh, this practice was not unique with the ethnic. As early as the 1750s, Nicholas Owen, an English reporter, reported a mulatto trader on the Windward Coast who lives after the manner of the English, having his house well furnished with English goods and his table tolerably well furnished with country produce. He dresses gaily and commonly makes use of silver at his table, having a good, a good sideboard of plate. Efi traders expressed discernment and preferences in the selection of their luxury goods. Now, We might at first be tempted to filter these objects into these two material categories, African and European. But when European goods are purchased by African consumers, they're experienced by those African consumers as an integrated whole. Ifik elites often painted their houses in bright colors and in geometric patterns, purchased and used English-made furniture, and dyed on Ifik cuisine using English silver, wearing West African clothing. These material choices reflected intentional consumption patterns as West African elites curated their own experiences of the Atlantic world. After generations of consumption, European goods, even luxury goods, were neither surprising nor alien in African port cities. While Ifik traders could don English clothing when dining aboard a ship, 
they could just as easily integrate eFeq and English modes there and elsewhere. The eFeq had been consumers of European manufactured luxury goods for a long time, generations in fact, and that inflow of materials and objects inevitably changed eFeq modes of material expression and their reception over time. Duke Ephraim, another eFeq trader, generally dressed very simply, consisting of a pan or a mantle with a sash formed of a white handkerchief or a piece of cloth. But on occasion, <clears throat> on occasion, his dress was more gaudy and imposing, including a sort of robe or mantle that reached to the knee and composed of several colors and a silk sash thrown over the shoulder, a gold-laced round hat like those worn by gentlemen's servants, which is sometimes set off with plumes of feathers. Duke Ephraim knew that his attire depended on materi European materials, forms, and manufacture. They were likely ordered from Liverpool factors. But the assemblage was entirely his own. He was an elite man self-fashioning from the goods made available by participation in the Atlantic market. That same strategy was apparent in the importation of Western furniture and household goods. In his 1846 description of the house of Chief Willie Tom Robbins, Waddell indicated that the house is of native structure surrounded, surrounding a quadrangular courtyard with an inner court for his private use painted in Calabar style, yet containing English uh, furniture and trade goods. Robbins had imported English manufactured furniture, but had not yet chosen to import a Liverpool house frame. Importantly, this material integration still accommodated traditional religious and political practices. Waddell noticed two human skulls in the ground at his doorstep, the skulls of my enemies which he writes, were deemed of use for keeping out other enemies. Such things were seen at, the, at every door in the t at that time in Creektown. European objects were surely enlisted into long-standing eFeq political hierarchies. While communities were long organized by family-affiliated multi-generational houses, as I've already unpacked, all the houses of a community and all the communities of a district were subject to the laws imposed by the EPCA society a hierarchical organization that oversaw legislative, executive, and judicial functions across this whole network of towns. While the number of ranks in the EPK changed over time, there were five reported in 1828 and almost 11 two decades later, the mechanism for populating the ranks was quite stable, simple membership fees. Membership in a rank depended on payment. The higher the rank, the dearer the price. While it was more commonly men, membership was also open to wealthy women. Oral tradition even records a few Liverpool ship captains and merchants who purchased membership into EPK society ranks. But it is also clear that once membership was purchased into a rank, objects and adornment signaled that rank. Ostrich feathers, for example, were sumptuary goods reserved for membership in only the highest of the EPK rank. Historian David Imbua argues that EPK society created a stability that made trade with the elite, uh, the EFIC, all the more appealing amongst British captains. It increased the centrality of economic exchange in everyday life and grew in its own power in the 18th century, eventually overriding and stabilizing social structures elsewhere. While the historical record does not capture any evidence on this, it seems fair to assume that European luxury goods, including imported houses, might well have found their way into the material expressions of this severely hierarchical, wealth-dependent fraternity. Thus, in sum, elite eFeq traders were savvy businessmen, seasoned by generations of trade with Europeans and often acting on information and relationships built while educated abroad. They were voracious consumers of British and European manufacturers, ranging from mahogany furniture, richly carved mirrors, spectacular chandeliers, to silk and gold-laced coats and plumed hats, goods which they imported and integrated into their own material worlds. And for a few of the very wealthiest, these items were exhibited in a Liverpool manufactured house. The idea of a pre-manufactured, sorry, prefabricated house, disassembled and shipped to West Africa in the hull of a British ship might seem a little surprising, but it actually shouldn't. Shipping prefabricated house frames established from established ports to the tropical periphery of the British Empire had been happening throughout the 18th century. In a brief study of the customs records in certain regions of Maine and New Hampshire, for example, historian James Garvin uncovered 147 building frames shipped out just between 1770 and 1775 alone. 
He recounts that these ranged from planters' houses to stores and shops, but also including Negro huts. Many of these buildings were destined from Granada, Tobago, Dominica, and St. Vincent's, all newly acquired by Britain from France in, of course, in the 1763 Treaty of Paris. As was common for houses built by British colonials across the tropical reaches of their empire, these pre-manufactured houses were often described as including a gallery, which was referred to as a piazza or a veranda in the West and the East Indies, respectively. In 1794, economist and abolitionist Carl Bernard Wadstrom published a treatise arguing for the colonization and development of plantations in West Africa, primarily to incentivize the abolition of the slave trade. Amid his extensive discussion of his pr proposed plantation economy, he offered advice on houses designed to preserve settlers' health and comfort, arguing that the high mortality rate of the British in Africa was owing to the want of good houses. Illustrated with an architectural section, his treatise urged colonists to build a single-story house raised on piers to a proper elevation above the ground in order to give free circulation of air underneath to carry off harmful vapors. And importantly, the whole was encircled by a gallery covered by the projecting roof of the house all, all around in order to keep off the sunshine. And to erect these buildings more quickly, he suggested that they be pre-manufactured in England and shipped to Africa as a kit of parts. Just two years earlier, the Sierra Leone Company had erected a church and a warehouse, a range of shops, two hospitals, and several dwellings in Freetown in Sierra Leone, all of which arrived there as pre-manufactured building frames. The governor's house, one of those several dwellings, was very much like Wadstrom's model, including elevated single floor living surrounded by shaded galleries. Unlike those intended for Sierra Leone, the shipments to Duke Town were driven not by British supply, but by local demand. Prefabricated houses had been produced by Liverpool house builders for African traders since at least the 1780s. Each of these two-story houses observed by Waddell in 1846, for example, were likely pre-manufactured in Liverpool. The importation of these Liverpool prefabricated two-story frame houses corresponds closely to the rise of Calabar's mercantile households. As described by Akon Oya, a traditional, traditional Ifik households um, were comprised of several compounds, each dominated by internal courtyards called Isid Aibet or Isid Esa. These courtyards included deep verandas that accommodated everyday activities inside the house, like cooking and childcare. The head of the house of the family the head of the family, stood at the center of each compound, surrounded by the houses of his wives and relatives. The head of the household would usually receive visitors on veranda benches, whereas earlier households were comprised almost entirely of individuals from the same family, meaning actually a kin network. The increased labor demands of the new houses participating in the mercantile economy um, meant the incorporation of non-relatives, resulting in the adoption of a totally new word, ufok, for household meaning a word that broke the earlier alignment of household and family as one. While scholars have often presumed to see the rise of West African slave trade and their growth of the, of the Atlantic market of global goods through the lens of British ports and American plantations, elite Africans also benefited from the slave trade and the rapid expansion of their wealth through the 18th century had a profound impact on the social and political structures in West Africa. African elites used this new world of goods to navigate the world of business and to secure their social and political standing in their communities. Items of personal adornment, portable luxury objects, rich furniture, and even whole houses were purchased and became the building blocks of new strategies for cementing the local power of elites under the growing wealth through the later 18th century. So just as with personal costume, the elite of Calabar folded their new architectural solutions into existing material and social structures. Uh, even uh, Obong Ayemba's Iron Palace, with which we began, once rebuilt along the Calabar River, was literally enmeshed in long-standing social and spatial practices. Waddell described the palace as surrounded by eight or nine courtyards for his wives, for Obong Ayemba's wives, domestics and trade goods, each comprised of low-thatched rooms, one opening into the next. The public courtyards were tastefully painted in gay and bold native patterns by native pigments, 
his women being the artists. Now, Waddell also noted along the street in front of the Iron Palace was a long sofa-like seat made of beaten clay, well-shaped and painted, the traditional space for the reception of local visitors. The importation of the Iron Palace was not the adoption of an entirely new material practice, but the incorporation of a new material expression into the evolving social structures of power and wealth in that community. In his 1805 visit to an account of Calabar, Nichols recorded the delivery of an umbrella to the king. Gifts of large and brilliantly colored umbrellas had long been given as tribute to Africans from European and British ships captains and agents. An extraordinary 1818 sketch of the first day of the yam custom is probably the most striking visualization of this practice. Located in Kumasi, which is now in modern Ghana, this festival celebrated the arrival of annual tribute to the king of the Asante, who in the sketch is seated on the throne under a central elephant-crested crimson umbrella surrounded by flags representing the various European countries that he counted among his trading partners. In the 1840s, Waddell described the arrival of Obong Ayamba Honesty of Creektown in Calabar by his great canoe, covered by an immense and handsome umbrella of various colors. The canoe boasted an English ensign with his name thereon in large captive, in capitals. In the same narrative, and this is the only example of, of a surviving 19th century canoe I can find. This is in the Pitts Rivers Museum in Oxford. It's a little model that was made by a uh, West African for a collector who eventually brought it to Oxford. In the same narrative, Waddell recounted the great canoe of Ayamba, the occupant of the Iron Palace. His great canoe was de gaily decked out with several ensigns streaming in the wind, British ensigns, with his name thereon in large letters. The little house amidships was brilliantly painted red and yellow. Astride the roof thereon sat two men beating drums with all might and main. Before it stood Ayamba, Shaded by his grand umbrella, dressed as usual, except in having a gold lace cocked hat under his arm and a splendid sword, a present to him from the Dutch government at his side. Kings and chiefs across West Africa deployed colorful tribute umbrellas and ensign flags to signal status and authority. This function is made explicit in their choice to order objects emblazoned with their names. They also incorporated objects of British and European manufacture among the personal accoutrements feathered hats, walking canes, swords, and so forth, to the same ends. Ayamba's extraordinary iron palace functioned in much the same way. But how did the earlier, simpler, two-story frame houses function? Were they also bold declarations of power? Certainly, the very first imported frame house functioned to set that one trader apart from his competitors. But as others of very similar form arrived, these houses functioned more to cohere a community of elite traders across Duke Town to set Duke Town apart from the other potential trading communities, especially after the aforesaid massacre of 1767. Certainly, these two-story houses functioned to set their elite owners apart from others in their immediate community, most of whom lived in one-story earthen-walled courtyard houses. But since the Ifik and others along the Calabar River never allowed their partners to trade in, uh, partners in trade to build fortifications, these houses were not only the residents of the African traders and their families, but they were also centers of business and accommodations for clients. They were also commonly used to entertain or even house ship's captains and other English and European agents. <coughs> the ground floors likely also functioned as jails for newly arrived African captives. In this way, these buildings communicated to both locals and international business partners that this class of men understood their objects and spaces were used to convey status, but more importantly, were also used to signal their status as savvy consumers. These houses might even have been filled with objects that announced their international agency. And Terra Duke, an Ifik trader, for example, ordered in one shipment 12 brass basins engraved with his name. These houses clearly communicated that elite traders of Calabar were seasoned participants in the Atlantic market, one shaped by a world of goods. The consumption of European manufacturers by elite elite Ifik traders invites various interpretations. But the most direct is to simply understand these consumption practices as the expansion of African material worlds to include European manufacturers, even houses and paintings, as elements in the slowly changing practices of costly signaling, status performance, and social control that elites practiced in all spaces of exchange that shaped 
across the Atlantic marketplace. This transatlantic trade, of course, also had implications for architecture in Liverpool, and this is where we'll end. By the time of the exhibition of Obong Iyamba's Iron Palace in the square by the post office, the legal transatlantic slave trade was long over. But as David Pope's and Jane Longmore's research has shown, the wealth derived from the trade with Calabar's elite had reshaped that city in important ways. Even if the rapid suburban expansion of mid 20th century housing means that very few of these buildings now survive. Pope initially identified 39 country houses and suburban villas surrounding uh, Liverpool occupied by merchants deeply involved in the slave trade. Longmore, focusing more sp specifically on those houses actually built in the 18th century by merchants involved in the slave trade and therefore presumably funded by that trade, found 24 such country houses and villas, 10 of which were built in the 1770s alone. And I pause there just to say that the moment that we see the uh, beginning of the importation of houses from Liverpool to West Africa is exactly the same decade that we see the most rapid expansion of the new construction of houses by their business counterparts in the countryside around Liverpool. One of those was the, was the country house at Speaklands, built by Thomas Earle, whose family undertook 174 slaving voyages between 1699 and 1804. Thomas himself invested in 16 voyages to Calabar. John Tarleton, an investor in 25 voyages from Liverpool to Calabar, lived in Finch House. The Parr family, builders of both a country house called Elm House in 1770 and this grand townhouse on Colcott Street, were also deeply involved in the slave trade, investing in 13 voyages between Liverpool and Calabar from the 1750s to the 1800s. The large warehouse that still rises behind Parr House, you can see that on the left, is a stunning reminder of the vast volumes of trade goods and personal items shipped from Liverpool to Calabar and many other African ports. And participating in this trade generated enough wealth for families to buy into or build one of the most important signals of status in British culture, the country house. Thus, as EFIG traders were ordering two-story wood frame houses, their Liverpool counterparts were investing in country houses. But may we never forget the cost. The Voyages database records 469 voyages, disembarking from Liverpool to either Calabar or New Calabar over the course of the entire trade. 469 voyages deporting almost 150,000 people out of Africa into the forced labor camps that would be the plantations of the Americas. Thank you. So first of all, thank you, Lewis, for, for that incredible presentation. Um, I have the, the privilege of being able to hear my advisor present quite often. Um, and yet I still always learn something new and see connections um, in my work. And um, Rebecca has already told you what my work was to, to situate it for those of you that are new. In the room, um, my master's thesis concerned the architecture of slaving vessels, particularly in the 18th century, and more specifically, their change over time, the evolution of the structure. My dissertation concerns the waterfront spaces, um, select port cities, and also waterfronts that aren't ports, which are built or rebuilt um, in order to facilitate the transatlantic African slave trade um, throughout the Atlantic periphery. So I'm honored to be here, and I'm especially delighted because the theme for this series is so highly relevant uh, to my work. It's centering not only the ocean, but the mass of things which pertain to it, especially for myself um, and for Lewis, the 18th century, brings a lot of these topics together with vessels, ports, and waterfronts, issues of migration, most particularly forced migration. Uh, these topics have fre frequently been understudied, and part of the problem is the fluidity, literally, of waterfront spaces, which are constantly eroding or being deliberately shaped, and the ephemerality of vessels. Added to that is the increased difficulty of maritime archeology, span and it's easy to understand why maritime studies aren't as robust as some others. Uh, Mediterranean research a few decades ago, particularly maritime archeology, span was very transformative in centering oceanic studies, 
and the materiality pertaining to it, so I believe we owe a debt of gratitude to classicists and maritime archaeologists who brought some of those shipwrecks to light and have caused more awareness and interest in the public mind about what ships and boats may have been carrying, with whom they were trading, who was making the items, among many other things. This truly paved the way for subsequent researchers of maritime subjects to pursue material studies even if they did not have access to the shipwrecks and were relying on archival sources. I must admit that I rely heavily on archival sources, especially for events which actually took place in or on the water, um, particularly for my master's research on slave ships. As the ships, for the most part, no longer exist in any form, let alone the form which would have told us the most about their usage and intent, the primary evidence is documentary. Ship's logs, surgeons, and naturalists' accounts Sometimes the manifests are invoices for various goods and governmental regulations tell us a tremendous amount. Although I've undertaken some field work for that master's thesis, I can already see how much more prominently field work will figure into my own dissertation work on some of the port cities of the African slave trade, mostly because the cities are still there and relatively easily accessible. It's somewhat astonishing even with constant natural attrition and deliberate destruction or reconstruction, how much of the 18th century waterfront is still in evidence, and how much we can learn from these remnants, especially when paired with archival research. We can actually begin to see not only what the waterfront would have looked like, according to the structures, but patterns of movement and access of different demographics. So your chapter, it's highly relevant, underscores the importance of the waterfront sites and their restructuring due directly to the slave trade. I would like to begin with what I found most compelling about your article. Um, honestly, the, the one, the primary thing I found most compelling, in addition to the facts of this practice which you have uncovered and which I for one have heard about nowhere else, um, is the research you undertook to find this information. And as a researcher and understanding the kinds of sources you must have been utilizing, I have tremendous appreciation for that work that you've done. And another aspect I would very much like to acknowledge is the lens through which you approach this particular facet of the colonial world. You describe how this was not unidirectional, though definitely still heavily in favor of the European powers, practices such as you know, the importation to Africa of prefabricated houses gives a clear idea of just how much African elites also benefited as they were willing to sell their own people into slavery as Europeans were to purchase them. It also underscores another aspect of generalized African agency in a way we aren't usually examining when speaking of African agency. Now, I would be remiss um, in not pointing out one particular omission, and I feel that I understand why the omission is there and that you probably also would have preferred for it not to be there, and that is fieldwork. Um, I can say that I know for a fact how much you love doing field work and that you truly believe it's necessary and encourage it also in others. And I also believe that the majority of your research for this article was either digital or with materials that have been reprinted. And this was at least in part due to COVID. That was when you undertook this research. Um, I would have loved to be able to see how you would have engaged with the material remnants of some of these sites I know that field work is vital to your regular work, and as I read the article, um, I would have also loved to understand where exactly these sites were situated um, or how they were oriented. So how close to the water, what were the means of conveyance to and from. The, the huts were built right up to the structures. Was it visually obscured? Did it dominate the landscape in any way? Um, why was the each compound enclosed but not fortified? Was it just the visual representation of a boundary that was important. Um, and I believe with that, perhaps we will segue into, into our, our conversation as I have a, a list of other questions to help begin the, the question and answer session. Um, Do we? Okay. And so at this point, I think I'm going to sit down here so it's less less odd. Okay. 
Okay. Um, as architectural historians, it is vital for us to be able to situate ourselves within the urban uh, geography. So would you ever want to do a follow-up visit and do some field work to, I, I know that's a silly question, to contextualize these things, and do you feel that there's a way you might have been able to do any of that situating without field work? So Google Earth is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have done as much digital surveillance as possible through the various uh, um, uh, tools that are at our fingertips. And just by looking, so of course, digital, uh, Google Earth obviously is a view from above, mm -hmm. um, so we're making sort of assumptions around the particular, we know the dimensions, basically, of these, and they, those dimensions would result in a certain roof structure. Um, as I have surveilled these towns from above through Google Earth, there does not seem to be many surviving examples uh, of what would be in the landscape. Nonetheless, you're absolutely right. I'm deeply committed to centering the object. I'm an art historian at the end of the day. We have to document buildings, we have to document landscapes. And so I think that's a right criticism, um, even though I'm not particularly hopeful that there are many surviving examples. We do know that a Yumba's Iron Palace was deconstructed about 30 years after it was erected. Uh, we don't know where it went. Uh, so that building is, we have records that that is gone. Um, but some of these other timber frame houses, I wish they were there, mm -hmm. um, and at some point I should do uh, the, the work of going and actually determining, uh, determining that. So I would, would love to do that, but don't have plans in the next six months. <laughs> um, and then can you speak to why, with the wealth gained from slave trading and its ostentatious display um, in some of these houses, on these two points on the Atlantic periphery, um, let's say England and Old Calabar specifically, Britain managed to develop and retain more of the wealth generated from the trade and enslaved Africans, um, especially if you consider that it was a seller's market. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's a good point. Um, I think I would probably flip that just to observe that the EFIC traders are, um, the historical evidence suggests that the EFIC traders are far more financial any other African traders along the West African coast, with the possible exception of, um, there's a very interesting structure in Senegal. Um, so in terms of the French trading uh, tradition, uh, we, I'd have to excise that out. But relative to the relationships between British traders and their African counterparts, the EFIC are doing better than all other um, African in, uh, financial interlocutors. Um, that said, I mean, I, I, it, it, um, it's a little bit of a catch-22, because a part of me wants to say, well, I mean, their, their sense of competition is against their other African counterparts, uh, but many of these men have been to Liverpool. They've been educated um, uh, at, at you know, English universities. Uh, so they're aware of the material capacity and the extraordinary wealth that this is generating as they're there at university in the 1770s and 1780s. So they have a sense for what the kind of material bar is. Um, uh, but it does, I, I don't get any sense from the, the scant surviving accounts that we do have produced by Africans, and there are some. Um, uh, there's just not a sense of um, y'all got more than I did. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you know, the records are so few, it's hard to get a sense for that. So I'm going to kind of plead the fifth. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you spoke to how frequent shipboard dinners with slaving captains and dinners hosting the British visitors on land in their own homes allowed the EFIC uh, elites to navigate some of these, these social dynamics um, and these hierarchies. And how did the, and how the EFIC kings who did made, uh, purchase made goods, they would display them either in their homes or on themselves. Um, but the British accounts, many of which I've also read, of those who witnessed this seem fairly derisive um, with some of their descriptions, um, pointing out all of the sartorial or social transgressions that were being committed yeah. while the EFIC elites were, you know, were displaying these, these items. How effective do you think the display of European wealth and taste by EFIC kings was when viewed by Europeans? Yeah, so that's actually an interesting question because I, I don't think the EFIC kings that are doing this, well, I should back up on that. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much they actually care, right? And that is, uh, they're pretty powerful people in their immediate local mm -hmm. environments. They're navigating those spaces with quite a bit of savvy, quite a bit of success. Um, I think it's fair to say that 
you know, the portrait of, the, of uh, John Quaranti is extraordinary portrait, right? He's clearly represented uh, properly, uh, properly according to sort of the English taste, um, uh, wearing that suit, yet uh, when he, you know, a few years later, he may don just the jacket uh, and no shirt whatsoever. Uh, and so I think that they're, they're able, uh, these EV kings are able to pivot back and forth um, uh, to kind of code differently in different contexts. And so I, I, think, that, I think that we need to give them uh, enough agency to be able to navigate those different contexts and un to do so understandably. I also think as historians, we bear a responsibility, as you rightly point out, the kind of cultural criticism that uh, is embedded in a lot of the narratives that I'm reading. It's really important that we not um, fold those into our own interpretations in the present, right? That we have a kind of critical lens uh, understanding that that particular early 19th century or late 18th century British critique um, is gonna be laden with a certain bias it's our responsibility as historians to be attentive to and name that bias. Report on it, that's fine, mm -hmm. of course. Inclu include, the, include the account. Um, but make sure that we disentangle that bias from whatever is proper or true, right? Because those contexts are gonna be different. Okay, and then um, second to last, my penultimate question here. So there was not a reciprocal attempt by British traders um, or co correspondents to don African attire when they were, um, or, or to integrate African practices in an analogous manner with those traders, but there definitely were some material practices to signal um, to signal the the connection with Africa, and a lot of those are architectural. Yeah. So why do you think there was that difference? Yeah, I I, th I think that might just be the scant surviving evidence that we have. I mean, mm -hmm. I. I've pretty much given you all of the evidence. Right? It's not like there's an ocean of other stuff that's down there that could be, like mm -hmm. this is pretty much all of it. Um, and so it's pretty thin evidence. I think when we look at um, British Creoles in the West Indian context, we see a pretty substantial, uh, in terms of costume transformation, uh, other material transformations, architectural transformations. I think that um, European captains, when they're in residence in these African contexts, do begin to adopt. I think we just probably don't have evidence that survives to demonstrate that because we have clear evidence that they're doing that in the West Indies, right? And so their long engagement with Africans and African cultural performances in the Jamaica, for example, which I know better, they're clearly adopting West African practices. Uh, whether they'll name that or not is different. But as you know, from a distance, we can see that uh, those are they're clearly African origins to certain things they're adopting. So there's no reason to believe that they're not doing the same in West Africa. And I think that's just the evidence base. Okay. And then the last question is: We're here at the Paul Mellon Center for British Art, and I know that your early training was as an art historian. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so could you offer a defense of this content as being important for scholars studying British arts? <laughs> is this, in fact, an art history lecture? <laughs> uh, well, it's an architectural history lecture, and I count architecture uh, as art. Yeah, I think, I think it's important um, for those of us that were trained, I mean, I'm trained as a very traditional art historian, right, um, uh, to think about, I think the best work is happening at the edges, right? And I think that's interdisciplinary edges. I think that's geographical and temporal edges. I think the edges is where the interesting dynamic research is happening. That's been true for decades. Um, and so I think that uh, I'm delighted that the Paul Mellon Center invited me to give a paper uh, today. And I think that um, it's really important for art historians to be seeing the horizon, even if their work remains in the center, which is fine. We still need good scholarship in the center. Um, but I think we need to always be looking at what the horizon is, and that's the intersection, the engagement, the dynamic, the challenges of interdisciplinary work. Um, I read a lot of so social historians. I'm reading economic historians, historical archaeologists. We have to be reading outside of our discipline because those methodologies completely transform the ways that we think about the materiality that we're confronted with with the objects that sit in front of us, right? And so as an art historian, I'm always going to center objects, right? You have to have things, and even though I actually don't have any things. <laughs> but I've made up a bunch of them and put on the screen for you. I think that we have to engage with materiality. Materiality still matters a lot. Visual evidence is central. It's what makes us art historians. Um, but, we, but we do have to confront the disciplinary boundaries uh, that are essential to the making of our field, because I think that uh, that's where the dynamic work is. And with that, I think we open up. Yeah. Great. All right, bring it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So, oh,
When you mentioned the prefabricated houses being traded to Africa, right, I was kind of curious if, because it doesn't seem economically advantageous to do so rather than just, I guess, transporting blueprints or drawings and then constructing them there. So was there some cultural cachet to having the houses made, prefabricated, and then bringing them over? Yeah, there's two. You've just hit one. Um, as I'm arguing here, I think that this, these houses are evidence of the financial relationships between mm. individuals, right? They're the kind of visual manifestation of, uh, of, of economic partnerships. So on that point, I do think that's cachet. It's also true that West Africa is, has a whole lot of tropical hardwoods. Tropical hardwoods are twisted and gnarly. Uh, they don't lend themselves to two-story timber frame houses. <laughs> Right? And so on there's, you know, English oak is just far better uh, for that kind of work. And so on some other level, um, it's very difficult to build a two-story frame house out of the surviving uh, woods that are available uh, in, these, in the regions that we're talking about. So there's also just a kind of practical uh, solution to that. Right. But I think the signaling uh, is the far more important piece. Got it. Right in front of you. Um, we have a question online yep. from Kim Rawlinson, Hello, who Kim. writes, <laughs> I have an interest in 18th century Liverpool merchants. Do you have the names of those supplying the prefab houses? Does the name John Cragg feature? I do not have the names, <laughs> and I've never heard of John Cragg. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Kim. Um, I don't have that. No, the... Um, uh, Ambrose Lace, who, Kim, I'm sure you probably know Ambrose Lace's, uh, his account books. It, it has everything to do with surviving account books. Uh, Ambrose Lace's account books are robust. He's doing a ton of trading with Liverpool at this point, so we know a lot about Lace's partnerships uh, in, uh, in Calabar, um, but not really many others. Most of the others are accounts by travelers who point to the systems, but they're not the actual account books. Lace is a rare survival. Hi, excuse me, I am not an architectural historian. You're welcome I've anyway. I've been surrounded by them for much of my career. <laughs> uh, so I've picked up a little around the edges, yeah. which is, as I'm sure you can relate. Um, they wouldn't count me an architectural historian anyway, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I would not be surprised if all of the wood that was supplied by British ships to the west coast of Africa was actually New England. Oh, that's actually, you're, you're exactly right, yeah. Um, all of it was, yeah. was Maine and you know, shingles and pine boards and all of that, but um, I wonder if you've ever been to Belize. The government house in Belize is mm -hmm. the spitting image of the house that you yeah. showed, the identical floor plan. Mm -hmm. I was always told it was one of many government houses, so the whole notion of the British system being implanted with clarity of the identity. Yeah. Um, it's, I guess, one of the very few survivors, but may not be the only one. No, there's actually a number of them in Jamaica as well. Okay. Um, they're scattered across. They're associated with uh, government officials. They're associated with the, naval, uh, the British Navy officers. Um, so very frequently, you can look up um, English Harbor in Antigua and look at Clarence House, and it'll look exactly like the house you're talking about. Um, and what's interesting, and I've published on this as well, uh, these, uh, these houses, which really kind of cohere as a form, in Jamaica I call them Creole houses, but the names are always kind of situated, uh, they're locally situated. Um, but if you look at the floor plans, they're not very different from uh, what agents of the East India Company are building in northern uh, India that would eventually become called a bungalow. And so the floor plans, the arrangements, the spatial distribution of the bungalow, as well as these Creole houses in the West Indies uh, spilling over into Belize, um, the materiality is very different. The m building materials are different, but the spatial arrangements, the floor plans are pretty consistent. And so um, uh, I have a different uh, article in which I've uh, argued that this is part of the Anglo-Tropical Empire. So the, uh, these are the architectures of the Anglo-Tropical Empire, and in this piece I'm just centering African consumers, but there's huge numbers of these also being sent out or built by, Af uh, by English agents uh, across the, the West and the East Indies. Um, hi, really interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, I work with some of our photographic collections at the British Museum, mm -hmm. and so I was interested to see some of the photos that you've been using. But yep. I'm, I was wondering um, to what extent photographic collections have been useful in your work, but also how accessible they are 
Um, they're sadly not nearly as carefully dated as I would like. <laughs> so if we can have that conversation, that is. Um, yeah, so enormously helpful. There are four or five robust collections that I've been using from your catalog. So first of all, thank you for digitizing them and making them available. Incredibly useful. Um, but, uh, and I'm, I'm not a, um, a specialist in photography, and so I'm sure that there are visual cues uh, that are part of the production of the photographs themselves that could help uh, lock them into a couple decades. Uh, that would actually be just really helpful to make sure that I think I'm pretty much working with like 1890s photographs, but I don't really know. <laughs> um, and so, um, so that would be an enormously helpful thing. But the, the high res scans of them, the fact that you've got the, rev uh, the reverse of them as well, it's really helpful. Um, so yeah, no, I've, I've been swimming through your collection, so thank you for putting them online. And I was thinking of other collections as well, how accessible yeah. other institutions are with their photographic collections. And oh, uh, y'all's are the best. <laughs> 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 if you like, no, really, uh, you, yours, yours have been far more helpful. I mean, I'm sure there are others, but they're just less accessible. The fact that you've digitized so much is why I keep coming back to yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your talk. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I'm a social anthropologist mm -hmm. talking about the edges and mm -hmm. uh, investigations, and I'm interested in textiles. So yeah. with these two um, robes, how did they get to the area? How did people order it? Yeah. Um, obviously, there yeah. was no online ordering or right. something like right. that. So, that's right. That's right. Yeah. so I'm fascinated by the ways. How did they do it? And did where did you find these um, yeah. costumes? So uh, I these are not late. those. Maybe I missed it. Yeah. So, so. these uh, everything that I have shown you are just representatives from fantastic collections across the UK. None of which, none of the material objects that I've shown, with the exception of the very first print actually are from West Africa, right? And so these are all um, uh, visual representations of things that are showing up in the accounts. And so I'm just giving you a kind of visual record. But to answer your more specific question, um, uh, there, are, there are bodies of letters from these West African chiefs ordering all kinds of fine goods from their counterparts, especially in Liverpool. And so they're requesting uh, red and blue gold-laced coats, uh, full gold-capped canes, these are part of an inventory of requests that the, their counterparts, the merchants in Liverpool, will then assemble these goods in an, in an effort to curry favor with these African chiefs so that when they're participating in the slave trade, uh, they're getting um, privileged access to uh, more quickly filled uh, ships for the transatlantic mm -hmm. slave trade. Mm -hmm. And another quick question. Yeah, of course. When would they use these... Uh Robes, would they just use them when traders from England or English people came, or would, you, would they show off? Yeah, I think there's a grayscale. I think we, we should think about them as a grayscale, right? And that mm -hmm. is, uh, it seems from the accounts that I've read, they're clearly bringing out as much of their English finery as possible when they're dining aboard a captain's ship. Yet, there is a kind of middle zone. They may wear the coat, but with no shirt. Um, no, no shirt underneath, when they're entertaining that ship's captain uh, in their house um, uh, in town. And when they're engaging simply with their African counterparts, they may not wear it at all, right? And so I, yeah, I think it just becomes a kind of tool that signals uh, a range of different strategic social opportunities. Thank yeah, you. That's a great question, thank you. Yep, here in the back. I'll be quick. Thank you. Um, fascinating talk. Perhaps you could just briefly sketch out the subsequent history of Calabar during the 19th century and then also perhaps post-independence. What is this city like today? Is it still a port city? Is that its main economy? Thank you. Yeah, no. Um, by the middle of the 20th century, it's become completely marginalized, which is one of the reasons that, I just mean economically marginalized, um, which is one of the reasons why so many uh, West African social and economic historians have turned their, their lens to this to try to understand uh, prior to the mid 20th century explosion of the ports, which are much closer to the Atlantic at this point. Most of these are kind of up the river. Um, the industrial expansion 
of transatlantic shipping in the 1960s and 1970s demanded a much more robust infrastructure than these river fronts could possibly accommodate. Um, and so we see in the last quarter of the 20th century a shift amongst African historians to better understand um, the kind of prehistory, which is what results in this kind of robust under, an understanding of the 17th century participation and agency by these African chiefs in, um, in the transatlantic uh, market. So um, we have one more question online, and then for the rest of you who have questions in the room, uh, I think we might do that over drinks so that we can do it in a more informal way and, and circulate. Um, but someone online uh, asks, any comments or leads on the role or relevance of 18th century Scottish merchants slash colonial trade networks or wood production slash architecture in this? Thank you for the talk. Absolutely. Um, uh, so a really fantastic historian uh, by the name, last name of Karras has done some fantastic work on Scottish um, immigrates into the Caribbean. And so there's not a huge Scottish footprint in West Africa that I'm able to find. But if you look at the north coast of Jamaica, the vast majority of settlers on the north coast of Jamaica are Scottish origin. And so you'll see houses named Edinburgh, um, uh, Andrews, Stewarts, they're everywhere. And so the Scottish story is really in Jamaica. And you can find that in a chapter in my book. <laughs> but um, um, so with that, I think we're going to wrap up this portion of the evening. Um, but before we do that, I would like to give one final thank you to Lewis and Shaheen. This was incredible. Thank you.